Howdy, howdy, folks. Howdy, howdy. We got a special guest with us. Yeah, I'm about to uh, about to get him in here in a minute. He's coming in here. Josh is coming in momentarily. He's about to request access. We'll get him in here and we'll get this conversation started. It's going to be one heck of a night, folks. One heck of a night. Just need him to request access and we'll get it. We'll get it on the road, and then I will introduce myself. We'll introduce Josh. We'll make sure uh, we'll make sure everything's squared away and everybody gets going. Here it is. Here he is. Hold on. Should be coming in here momentarily. Give us a couple seconds here. Here we go. There he is. Josh, how are you, my man? Doing good. How's it going, man? It is going super well. I, I could not appreciate your time more this evening. I, I cannot appreciate the perspectives you've already shared with me and what it is you're about to go over with our platform and yours. Thank you so much for sharing your time. Guys, thank you so much for having Josh here. Thank him. Uh, I'm going to give myself just a little bit of an introduction here so you guys know who's talking to you. And then I'm going to let Josh have the floor because you guys, his background's phenomenal. So I am a college dropout. I graduated from high school in 2018, went to yes. college, went to college for one year, realized that I needed to put myself in a corner and really decide who I was. And I needed to work hard. Um, fast forward now, what I found out that summer was I needed to do trade stocks. I needed to have my own income, right? Very analytically, analytically based. And I was very, very much interested in the stock market. And I worked multiple jobs. I worked in corporate finance. I worked in cybersecurity, personal protection. And I worked all over the place. But the underlying factor here is that brings me to today is that I traded into the stock market. And I really enjoyed every bit of it. So, and it's now presenting me opportunities with a gentleman like this man right here so that I get to have incredible conversations and provide you guys some wonderful content. Guys, the topic tonight is long-term investing and trading entries and exits and we have a lot to cover and we're also going to cover some uh some live events going on here tomorrow and throughout the rest of this week josh please provide your introduction i would love to hear it yeah absolutely i love that people said uh we're good looking cads i appreciate that gentlemen now okay. as far as my background so 18 i uh, moved to texas joined the military so i was in the army national guard for six years during that time i studied economics got my undergrad and master's there and uh started working for the banks as a mortgage-backed securities trader. And so I spent four years hedging uh, a mortgage portfolio, trading the swaps and the TBAs, mortgage forwards. Got my CFA during that time. And what, about eight months ago, I transitioned in the time as a full-time entrepreneur and uh, real estate investor. And now recently, about six months ago, I became an um, investment advisor for a small boutique firm. So that's kind of what I specialize in now. Well, now that you guys understand that this man's an absolute unit, all right, you understand where he's coming from. So you'll know that what it is we are talking about today is going to be worth your time. And I'm going to do my absolute best to make sure it is on my end. I know he's got nothing to worry about, right? So we've got a couple of things going on. You guys are already asking questions about the FOMC meeting. Don't worry. We've got plenty of opinions that we're willing to share about that. And yeah. Josh, thank you so much for providing your background. You're a freaking animal. So one of the first things that I want to cover in today's topic before we start going over all the meetings in the whole nine yards, because I want you guys to stay around for that. We've got a lot going on with that. And there's a lot going on with the market and the Fed specifically. So first thing, Josh, I want to go over in regards to your long term investments. What are you looking for with underlying companies, securities? What are how are you gauging your long term metrics for whether you want to get in? What looks appetizing to you? And when do you know? when to get out, right? What's the fundamental and technical side for you? Yeah, for me right now, I'm really more of like a thematic fundamental analysis or fundamental guy. So with me right now, I kind of like to look and see style, style shifts. So, you know, value to growth. So I like to play that shift. Um, and also kind of trying to see trends. So right now, right now, it's a lot of growth. I talked about this a little bit, you know, in the beginning of the year, we had a big at least they tried to value shift. And now, you know, the last three months or so, the NASDAQ has really been picking it up. And I think, especially in the last month, we've seen that I don't think the value trade is going to stick. I, I do think there's room for growth to go. And what am I looking at? I'm looking for the growth at a, a reasonable price. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Microsoft at these levels right now. Big, I mean, That's just how it is. Big fan of Microsoft. 
Google, things of that nature. And that's what I'm looking for. I think the other thing why I think growth is doing well is this idea that there's so much cash still sitting on the sidelines. And I think growth has represented this safe haven post COVID world. That's where, you know, money was made and just holding, right? If you held, you did just fine during COVID. And I think that's where people are going to go um, again with their strategies, go towards that growth. At least in my opinion. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that's phenomenal. So I'll, I'll address a little bit more of the technical side for me because I am a long-term trader uh, and I, absolutely apply everything that Josh is referring to in regards to maybe some of my longer term positions, maybe share positions, right? Maybe yep. not necessarily as much with options. Options are more of a technical nature. There are leaps, very, very much long, long, like year or two year out expirations, which you can apply the same fundamental analysis. And what Josh covered was perfect, right? So for me, what I look for, and Josh mentioned the COVID dip, the COVID dip for long-term traders was one of the most incredible opportunities that probably we'll see in a, in a while, right? It, we had the S&P 500 down almost 50%, if not a little bit more than that. And we, it's just opportunity fist over fist. And a V-shaped recovery. <laughs> and a V-shaped recovery. About my favorite letter now from here on out, purely because of that formation of the charts. So for me, very specifically... When we, we'll talk about current events. The S&P 500's been falling. We're having a brutal month of September. And Josh, I want your opinion on this in a second. We're having a brutal month in September. It's something annually that we usually see red in because a lot of the banks are covering the profit loss. We've got a couple other, uh, couple other catalysts involved with the market pulling back. And we have not had that large of a pullback in a while. So just a couple of different annual catalysts in regards to the bank specifically brought our market down from the beginning of September. We've been falling for a little bit, right? But a little bit of this is bad timing. We've got the FOMC meeting, which everyone gets scared around and usually sells off because everyone's worried that the Fed might bump interest rates up a little bit. We already understand inflation's up, right? I think It's already priced in, I what? think. It, it's large. I mean, the paper's priced in. Uh, it is. So it's odd um, that markets are reacting like this, but it is what it is. I think it's the red September. I think it's the red September as well. So give me give me your broader perspective on this. I got to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I think the VIX breaking 20, and then yesterday it broke the key level of 25. I think a lot of people are reading too much into what that represented. For me, being on the institutional side, you know that those VIX levels are key triggers on the risk management side of institutional portfolios. They have to trim. They have to start trimming. So I think that um, further added fuel to the fire in the sellout yesterday. Um, but then you saw people come right back in, right, and start, you know, open higher, gapped off. And so with that, it's like, it's an odd thing, right? You have all these negative catalysts in the market, but people are still feeling good, I think. A uh, couple of other things I want to mention. September is kind of like you said, an anomaly. So there's a lot of things that you, fundamentally, it's not there. What happens with September, uh, one thing that a lot of people don't talk about is mutual funds actually, their year ends happen during september so that actually contributes to this kind of idea that september's are, are more rough in the market another thing is light trading volumes believe it or not when you're working at banks you you're, it's mandatory to take two week vacations so that actually contributes to light volume which is selling pressure so that's another thing because when i was at the banks you have to take two week vacations all the way through so it's another kind of anomaly there to keep in mind I, I appreciate that so much. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, there's so many different factors going on. And, guys, you can make you know, a case for just about every catalyst that's going on. We have a lot of news going on in China. We've got quite a bit going on in Afghanistan. Very unfortunate. But we've got way too much going on with way too much, plain and simple. right? So you can take all these catalysts and you can say, wow, this could crash our market. right? Every single major pullback we've said, like, like Josh brought up, We've had an aggressive retracement back up. And every time you turn CNBC on, what are they telling you? And they're, they're mostly playing to the apes that I know you guys are in here, right? That whole ape community. Every time you turn on CNBC, they go, and Jim Cramer says the same thing. This is a buy-the-dip market, right? And they keep saying that. And I keep hearing this, and I go, okay, right? 
if I'm buying the dip and I'm a long-term investor, I'm already ahead of the game. And that's what I'm, we're looking for. That's what we're having a conversation about. But the thing here with Josh and I is if we're a long-term investor, yes, we know we're going to do well year over year because the market does well year over year, right? doesn't take anybody brilliant to understand that the S&P 500 annually does well, right? Present, yeah, look right. at the savings rates right now. We got elevated savings rate, not just from the retail, but the, the institutions are sitting on cash and they're getting antsy. So any dip that you said, it retraces instantly because people are antsy to get that cash working. So that's why, like, I don't think there's going to be a broad sell-off right now. I just don't. I'd be surprised. There's too much cash sitting on the sidelines. I'm still, I still think there's room to run, believe it or not. I, I'm going to keep repeating myself because I agree with everything that comes out of your mouth, Josh. You're, you're the man. You are the freaking man. So I, I, will also, I will also say this. Guys, you have to start looking at percentages, right? If you're looking at SPY on a two-year, five-year, one-year chart, you have to look at all of the drops that SPY has had. Take whatever yeah. your price is currently and divide it from the previous high. And you have yourself whatever percentage drop you do that. Well, you take the remainder and you've got a percentage drop. Right now, the low of day yesterday, we were just hovering at 5%, which is, right. what, which is what most people would call a healthy pullback so that we can trend higher. Josh, what do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, you know, you're seeing how, how long it had been until the 5% pullback. Has it been like how many trading days was it? Was it like 200 and something? It, it's, been, it's been multiple months, probably four or five months. Yeah. So, you know, that's something to think about. I think the other thing I'd like to mention is the reality is banks and the Fed are likely going, you know, the um, expectations for inflation are, are going up, I think. GDP growth rates are getting slashed down. So that's, I do think in the next decade, I don't think it's going to be as strong of a bull market. I think we'll kind of rotate in what I think you should be implementing your portfolio, income-driven strategies using cash-secured puts, covered calls on companies you still want to own, but that way you just kind of increase your ability to, uh, to generate alpha, in my opinion, by using these type of income-generating uh, strategies. What do you think? So I, I, I again... I agree with you spot on all of my share positions. I run covered calls with because especially in times like this, guys, when you're kind of losing your mind a little bit, the market's falling and you're not exactly sure what to do with the majority of your positions. Again, you have to be comprehensive in your analysis with the market. Don't always assume the market's going to go up. Don't always assume that the market might crash at some point. Yes. Inevitably both are going to happen. And the market's going to trend up more than it's going to fall, right? And that's the way it's going to be. You will have, and a lot of these incredible and big traders that are bears make a ton of money, but they make a ton of money on these plays, on these, I'm talking 30, 50, 30 to 50% pullbacks. And they can do that once every, what, 10 years that we have a pullback like that? Yep. And yeah, they're making a ton of money, right? But they still have long-term investments that they're running with and they've got an accumulation of cash that they're playing the downside. So they're taking opportunity of circumstance. And circumstance is what it is that we're looking at. In regards to trading strategies that you can use, whether the market's down or whether the market's trending up, whatever it's showing you, with covered calls right now, if you guys are doing them, the volatility, like, he, like Josh mentioned, the VIX is up. So, you, I mean, if you're trying to do, if you're trying to bank premium on sold calls against your 100 shares, you're getting a ton. Yeah. You're just getting a lot of money. And my positions are already running pretty heavy. Like, I, you know, because it's been a stellar year in the market, I'm okay with those covered calls. I'm okay with the shares getting covered away from me or called away because I need to rebalance anyways. So, I, I, sometimes I use covered calls as an exit strategy. I know a lot of people don't do it, but. I don't think it's that bad, actually, to do that. So uh, what I try to do is, in regards to how I – and I, I love that you mentioned that, Josh, because for me, with covered calls, if I'm holding if – I, if I did my absolute darndest as an individual and I saved up a lot of money and I got 100 shares of an Apple or a Facebook, somehow, some way, I got that money together, right? And I think Facebook – and I've been holding it. Like, I bought my 100 shares – and I've been waiting for it to drop because I just don't have the money to buy 100 shares of Facebook. That's a lot, right, for an everyday trader specifically. So 
you wait for Facebook to fall, for example, you buy in at a major dip, and then, oh my gosh, two months later, Facebook's up $50 a share, and I have 100 shares now running calls, plus an extra maybe 5 to 10% in premium, right? right? In regards to everyone's book, that's a winning trade, no matter how passive or how whatever you think of covered calls, right? That's right. a long-term strategy turned profitable in a short period of time. And I think, yep. so what do you have? One thing I want to mention, I think is important. You know, people say buy the dip. Would I usually implement my portfolio? Cause I'm usually a long-term guy. I don't trade too much other than selling weekly sometimes and selling monthly. Um, but with that, I always keep a five to 10% cash allocation. So right now people are calling buying the dip. I think the way to buy the dip is you scale into it. They're kind of like legs, like you like to do. Because I don't think you should just blow your entire cash load in the first 2% dip that you see in the market. So that's kind of, so I haven't um, blown my whole cash allocation yet by the dip because I still think there's a little bit more opportunity. So I'm scaling into it. Right. I think that's an incredible way to go because for me, even as a trader, you will never see me allocate everything I've got into any dip. It's not going to happen. Even if, we have a full blown market crash, God forbid. I'm still gonna have 20 to 30% left in cash because it's just necessary to have, right? right? And you need to build the discipline as a trader and as a long-term investor to know, hey, oh my gosh, I'm a long-term investor and I hold shares in Microsoft, SPY, Vanguard ETFs, but I'm looking at CNBC at my office at my day job and Don't I'm seeing them. a lot of red, Jimmy. I'm seeing a lot of red. So I probably should buy something, but oh my God, I have no cash because all my money's in all the positions that are down right now, right? right? That creates stress. And all you guys have to do is just build more capital so you have a cash reserve. Think of having an emergency fund for your life and your expenses, and then an emergency fund for your portfolio, all right? Their emergency it, You know, the funny thing is the best strategy, if you don't know what you're doing, the best strategy is just to buy and hold. Believe it or not, those are the people that, that won the most post COVID was just, you know, the ones who, you know, just buy and hold on a V-shaped recovery. Typically the first year buy and holders really do well. Second year, which is what we're in now, then you start seeing the day traders do a lot better. Um, swing traders. It's tough. This market's tough on the swing traders, but the day traders are making it out. Long-term holds though. I still think you'll make out just fine. Couldn't agree with you more. And I, the biggest the biggest thing for me is you guys look at the greed and the volatility and the fear indexes. And a lot of that revolves around people just not having the experience and know what to do with their money. And it also has to do with, yeah, all of those indexes are going to, are going to go start firing off like alarms when you see the market start to fall. Right. And a lot of people who are not necessarily educated investors, and if they are long-term investors, they're not long-term if they start selling when the market gets bloody, right? That's not what they do. Those are the individuals who know in five years, Microsoft's, Microsoft is still going to be on a completely diagonal chart, right? right? Just like you brought up Microsoft. And those are the people who have cash on the sidelines and they're ready to buy when shit like this happens. Excuse my friend. So they right. are, we're looking at this from a perspective of a lot of people in the market who have a lot of money want to leverage i mean there's a lot of people who leverage a ton of money in a short term time frame and the banks do it too so and the banks are really big players so are the hedge funds i call them the hedgies right the so, hedgies the suits i call them the hedgies i think they're adorable i call them the hedgies so i uh, i know for a fact that a lot of these banks are selling off creating short term profit right a lot of these banks and hedge funds trade on both sides of the aisle they make profit yep. way down and you better believe they're the ones first buying these dips cuz they know where the 100% all the market makers and yep. guys when the market's selling off and you've got oh my gosh the stock market is about to crash i'm going to lose all my money if you're a long-term investor you're buying right you want to be a bad buyer over time right exactly i always tell everybody that my favorite black friday is not matter of fact anything that i'm buying from amazon right black friday is events where we see five to ten to twenty percent dips in the s p 500 and all my favorite top holdings are on sale Right. Right. So absolutely. Ooh. What do you what do you got so, going on that? 
No, I like that a lot. Do you want to move to some questions? I know people uh, are probably asking asking some questions. I know they have them. I know. Is that what you wanted to cover? Absolutely. We can absolutely go into. What else would you like to add before we start answering questions? What else can I get a final piece from the the one, the only Josh Chad? I would say at the end of the day, um, you need to be a net buyer over time. Um, I will say opportunistically, I do like growth, but I think you have to have expectations that the next decade ahead, GDP growth is not going to be as impressive as, as it's been. Pretty much every major you know, bank has slashed their GDP growth forecast. So with that, I think you add to your, your watch list. If things get nasty in growth, I think you look at real estate. Real estate's big. Utilities. Real estate, utilities, what else am I missing? I wrote it down. Yeah, real estate and utilities are really what you want in your portfolio. And healthcare, I will say. Those, so those are three things that I would pay attention to. If for some reason this market gets bloody, you can go rotate into some of that. I think I think that's excellent advice. And I, um, guys, know, know that he is qualified to provide you as much advice as possible. He's checked. No, out. don't say that. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> but your boy over here is not. All right, I'm not qualified to provide you anything but my two cents, and it's all worth two cents, right, depending upon what you do. So, uh, Josh, I appreciate your input. We were going to cover the FOMC meeting, but I guarantee you we got some questions about it. So let's address those as we come. So I'm going I'm to – Yes, the financial sector. I do like bank stocks as well. They're an interest rate hedge. It makes a lot of sense for their commercial lending business. So, yes, banks That's, as well. Bank stocks are good. That, I'm very much an innovative technology. I'm a big tech guy. So I'm investing in things that I believe in companies that I believe will be running broader sectors of this market because there's a ton of tech sector, tech sector companies that are working with energy companies. There's a, no, a whole lot of tech sector companies that are working with real estate and pharmaceuticals and vice versa. So you guys have to look at the broader picture here. Everybody is in everyone's pockets and especially it has to do with contract. Yeah. people want contracts from everybody who's willing to pay, period. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah, what questions we got? Okay, Josh, first of all, let me just address the amount of compliments that you're getting is just unbelievable. You are well received yeah. on our platform, baby. Well, oh, I hope to come back. I like you guys. You guys are awesome. It's always fun talking to someone who loves the markets and has energy, right? That's what I care about. Well, I've got plenty of energy, and you, you don't do anything to deter that. I'll tell you that right now. So, yeah. I appreciate that. All right, let's see. Oh my God! I, I, not a whole lot of compliments or comments, just compliments. Everybody's really receiving this su super well. So, okay, in regards to just covering something that I know everyone's wondering about, because we're talking, there's a lot of ticker symbols and whole nine yards. What do you think about the FOMC meeting to come this tomorrow? What do you think is going to happen? How do you think the market's responding to it right now? What do you think is going to happen moving into the week and then to October? I don't think tapering is uh, is going to be a topic of dis discussion yet. I don't think so. I think it's already priced. The expectations are priced in now. I think that's a November meeting. I think what's going on now is uh, more more clarity because the economic summary report's coming out this week. That's going to give more direction on the GDP and the inflation. And I think that's what I'm paying attention to are those numbers. Um, I do think as of now, it's already kind of being priced in that inflation is probably higher and GDP, GDP growth is, is likely lower. So I don't think the sell-off is going to really continue that much further because I, I do feel like the expectations are already there. We've already been seeing weakening economic data. I don't know. Just my thoughts. No, I, I we're on the same page yet again. We're just flipping the book here, right? So I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. For me specifically as a trader looking at the dailies and looking at the one minute chart, even just to micromanage some of this, I truly believe, guys, that we've seen every single little sell off right before every FOMC meeting. And then we all realized that we overreacted, right? And we were just feared in, fear index spiked up a little bit. Everybody got a little wary about what could come out of J Powell, the money printer Burr's mouth, right? So everybody gets a little worried. And then you know, the buy volume starts popping back in. We gap up. And, you know, we've had a prolonged drop into this FOMC meeting, but that's because there's other circumstances involved. And Josh and I covered that thoroughly. So there's no need to go back over what we've discussed about September. Mutual funds, other catalysts, whole nine yards, 
foreign issues. So there's a lot going on. There's always a lot going on, right? So don't overthink it. So right. let's see if we've got any other questions that popped up since you and I covered that. Here we go. I have the same prediction as Josh about the FOMC meeting. Love it. Oh, that's Andy. What's up, you beast? Goodness gracious. We got a whole bunch of people in here. Love you guys. Thank you guys so much for joining. And thank Chad 2024. Boy, I couldn't agree with that more. Goodness oh, gracious. God, yes. If anyone's going to do this right, Josh, it's you, Chief. Goodness gracious. I wouldn't, I wouldn't last a second in politics. Not a freaking chance. Um, Someone asked, though, this is a good question, um, international exposure. I've talked about it a lot. Um, international, because <laughs> if you're going to go on international, you're, t you're probably going to have China exposure. I, th I do think Ch there's going to be an opportunity in China. I know a lot of, you know, there's this home country bias to a lot of people that they love domestic equities. I do think you pay attention to Chinese stocks, especially. I, I do like, I think I'm going to buy some Alibaba soon. I post. I I think uh, it's still trading far below its fair value. I think a lot of the damage from regulation is already going to be priced in. I don't think um, any more regulation is going to hurt the long term valuation um, and growth of Baba. That's just my opinion. I. So for in regards to the international side, I don't have a whole lot of exposure to it. I really stick domestic, and it's what I know. It's what I've researched. And I've spent way too much time understanding what I have in front of me, which is mostly domestic. And if I were to outsource my information, I'm just broadening something that I really am trying to stay specific in because I have a lot of goals that are correlated to a basket of stocks that I focus on. So if I can become a specialist with a basket of stocks, I'm not really going to need to outsource anything regardless of where opportunity might lie. Am I open minded to everything in the stock market and that everything it provides? Unquestionably. Right. Anyone out to any country, any company, revolutionary, high income, good business model, by no means am I right. not in that regard. I just do my absolute best to stick to what I know because I still don't think I know a whole lot about anything, really. So, you know, it, that's totally fair. You know, a lot of people get scared because of international. I think the way I look at international is you want assets that uh, are uncorrelated with each other, right? Or less than perfectly correlated. That way you're not too concentrated, you know, with uh, the U.S., their political structure, their market structure. You want a little bit of country diversification. That's why I like internationals. But someone asked about meme stocks posing a threat to the market. I'm curious about your thoughts on that. Okay. Like so those micro bubbles is what I like to call them. Right. I, I, that's a great that's a great description, because one of the things that we've been talking about in OBR is that some of these meme stocks in a very short time frame have almost reacted in the form of a hedge for the broader market falling, which is kind of unbelievable. Sure. There, there are times where we see the S&P falling and we see AMC running up to that moon that we've been talking about that I keep hearing time and time again. Right there. I mean, and it's unbelievable. And if you guys are looking to trade these stocks, be careful. Manage your risk. Meme stocks are called the meme for a reason. They're heavily manipulated, and you guys are fighting the banks on that. But that also doesn't mean the banks don't want to make money on what it is that they might be shorting, right? So, and, yeah. And a lot of these meme stocks, a lot of them are dying business models. So that's one thing I think. Are, you, are people scared that these stocks are going to crash the whole market? I don't think if AMC or GameStop crashes tomorrow, I don't think that's going to have any effect on your NASDAQ or your S&P 500. So I think those, those stocks are going to do their thing, and that's fine. But uh, I don't think it's going to affect the broader markets, in my opinion. And I, you haven't seen that. No, I, I, again, I agree with you wholeheartedly. So, and for me, we've got a lot of questions about NEO. I am actually a shareholder of NEO. It's one of my only international companies. And that is because NEO has quite a domestic influence as well. So then they're big in the electric vehicle business and they're trying to expand as quickly as possible. So I have a little bit of exposure and that's because I know that, that that's also just one of my growth stocks. I have NEO to run covered calls. And when NEO gets hit one week, I might sell that and get into another growth stock for a little bit of a little bit of a PNL sheet buffer, if you know what I mean. So if Neo gets hit real hard because it got some bad Chinese news about whatever's going on over there, that's all different. 
whole different conversation. And I'm down maybe a grand or so on my covered call position on my hundred shares. I might sell it, right? I might sell it and get that PNL, get that PNL covered a little bit. Maybe I just made a grand on the other side, right? On trading, credit right. spreads long term can be a little bit of a buffer because hey, I, I have a basket of growth stocks that I use for covered calls. Neo happens to be in that basket. It's got a good premium, right? And it used to have unbelievable premium back in February. Sure <laughs> so, Josh, any any final th thank you so much again for your time. You are an amazing individual to speak to. I have had the absolute time of my life in this call and our one on ones. You have so much incredible value to bring to the world, and I'm glad we can we can provide the the minimal platform that we're able to provide to you. And I love our platform. Yep our company but you deserve a much broader audience so we, no, i appreciate it uh, hopefully i'll be back uh because i love you guys you guys are freaking awesome keep rocking on and uh let's go guys, uh just keep being a net buyer of the equities if you have a long time horizon 30 40 years you should not be sitting on the sidelines don't try and tie the market it's not gonna you have such a long time horizon be a net buyer over time uh, start working. Start worrying about de-risking your portfolio later in your life. Uh, you don't really have to worry about it right now. It's a tremendous opportunity we're in right now. I can't. I could, couldn't have said it better. Can't follow it up any better. So we're gonna close it on that, guys. Thank you so much. Pounding the monster mid meeting. I love it. So oh. it's not a, sorry, it's not a claw, Chad. But best we can do on a public platform. You know what I'm saying? Thanks. Yep. Cool, clean, and conservative. I appreciate you. All right. You know how to go. All right, Beast. Thank you so much for your time. We're going to talk again soon. Don't you worry. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for joining. Appreciate it.